Hello, this is Kyle Davidson, and today we're going to be exploring a couple important concepts to, to radar. Um, and they are specifically the, uh, the matched filter, uh, coherent integration, and a little on the ambiguity function. And we're going to do this for three different waveforms. Uh, we're going to look to, uh, start with a very standard pulsed uh, radar signal. We're going to look at some linear frequency modulation. And finally, some phase shift keying through a, a Barker code. Um, and that's going to let us see an, a number of different responses inside the matched filter um, and then explore those a little more through the, the ambiguity function. And the, the first one we're going to start with is the pulsed radar signal. And I'll pull up the, the first figure here. Uh, so what I've done here is I, I've run a quick simulation inside MATLAB and uh, in the upper left uh, you can see I've got a, a transmit and receive signal and uh, the receive signal has a fairly high signal to noise ratio but it's being bounced off a, uh, a radar target which is pulse to pulse decorrelated that is the radar cross section actually is actually changing from pulse to pulse uh, but I've normalized both the transmit and receive signals just so we can see the scale for, um, a little better between the two uh, in the middle here and in the top we actually have the, the spectrogram um, which is both the uh, the frequency content versus time um, and uh, the, the amplitude is shown on the, the vertical axis so we can see as a pulse moves in and out of the this 25 microsecond observation window uh, where we have uh, some frequency content and, and uh, where we don't and the gaps between the pulses and that's a useful tool for analyzing radar signals over on the right we've got our power spectrum and this is just a straight up pulse uh, it's not modulated whatsoever so we can see right in the middle it's a, a nice sharp uh, spectrum and then over in the bottom it's not looking too interesting uh, we can see that the pulse is phase it's phase isn't changing we can see it's delay it's not changing as well and the real imaginary parts of the pulse we're not looking at the uh, the gaps between them, just the pulses themselves. Again, not much going on. What we're really interested in is the effects of the match filter, and we're going to go to that next. And here we start seeing some stuff of interest. So this is a non-modulated wave, and I won't go over the math for the match filter. I, I'll be doing a video on that shortly on um, match filtering and the ambiguity function, and a little bit the uh, how we solve these things mathematically. But basically, we're applying a filter, um, which is a time-reversed conjugate of the transmitted waveform. And that provides us the theoretical maximum of the signal-to-noise ratio. Now, down in the, the lower left, we have um, all the pulses that we saw before in the previous um, uh, plots in the time domain. And you can see how instead of... Um, the, the, when we're looking at the, uh, the magnitude up here in the upper left before, uh, we get these nice pulses received, very different amplitudes. Um, now we are looking at uh, the response to the match filter applied to each one of these. And because this pulse is modulated, its bandwidth is very narrow. And as a result, this match filter doesn't, as you can see, improve the range resolution much. We are getting, obviously, a peak um, and this is a, a, a decibel. If it was a straight uh, linear, uh, linear plot, you'd actually see a perfect triangular shape um, applied uh, to each pulse received. Now, over on the right, I've also, uh, on the lower right here, I plotted what we call the radar cuboid. And, and that radar cuboid is showing us something important. Um, it's actually what we would do if we were going to be looking at the, the fast and the slow time and we're applying some digital signal processing to get the Doppler out of it. We're not in this case. Uh, we're just seeing each one of these matched filters kind of stacked on each other. So each row, if we look from uh, left to right, is a pulse repetition interval. And you can see that in the match filter response as we go in the slow time axes, across each pulse of partition interval, changing the little magnitude, and that's simply because of the changing response of the, uh, the, um, um, the, the target that's being modeled. And uh, I simply did a pulse-to-pulse -pulse decorrelated one um, to show a little change from uh, from pulse-to-pulse -pulse so we can be better distinguish them in these plots. Now, what's starting to get important is in the upper left. Um, and the upper left is taking that same information for each pulse repetition interval, um, I have then examined it, applied the matched filter, 
integrated each pulse. Uh, in this case, we have eight pulses. And reduced the resolution to the appropriate range resolution for this radar. Um, so this range, the range resolution of this radar isn't particularly good. We're getting fairly large gaps um, uh, between uh, the various bits of, uh, of uh, uh, the various range bins. Um, and you can see that we get some integration, but because of the horrible bandwidth of this, uh, um, this I believe it's a 10 microsecond. We'll just go in and check the simulation. Uh, but yes, the pulse width is 10 microseconds, and the, uh, the PRI right here is 100 microseconds. Uh, we're not getting very good range resolution. And if we had two targets plotted up there, um, you would be able, to, you'd see that the, it would be hard to distinguish them. Now, I'm going to go to the last thing up here on the right on an actual separate plot. And this is the ambiguity function. It is generally approached, when you see it in the textbooks, um, in sort of not a terribly approachable way. Um, it, it's a little more mathematically complex than I think it, not that it needs to be because the math is what it is, but it's simpler conceptually than you'll see in the various books on, on, on radar signal processing or just radar theory in general out there. What the ambiguity function is telling us is the response of the matched filter as we change the target delay and the Doppler shift. So if we look on this axis over here, I'm going to turn the whole thing to the, the right a little, and we're just looking basically on the, the uh, response of the match filter versus time now. Um, if you just look at sort of the, the peak in the back, this is telling us for this, con in, this continuous pulse, the match filter peaks at zero when there is no delay, um, when the, the pulse and the match filter are lined up. And as they start to misalign, they lose alignment, um, in this case by 5 microseconds or 10 microseconds or 15 microseconds and so on, we get um, much less of a response from the match filter. Ideally, we would get a perfect spike at the middle at zero when the match filter and the pulse are aligned with each other and zero content elsewhere. That's never going to be the case. We'll see some definite changes with some, when we start modulating the pulse. Now, if we look over on the other axis, and I've plotted it for, a, a, in this case, the amount of Doppler shift uh, from left to right, we're seeing a change from of 5,000 to negative 5,000 um, kilohertz, uh, which is within the range what we'd expect for an airborne surveillance radar for uh, some, some pretty standard applications, um, especially if the two platforms are moving. But what you're seeing here is there's no Doppler shift, and we get in the middle uh, a peak response from the match filter. And that makes sense because the match filter and the pulse look identical in that case. As we move off, this what we're effectively measuring is the correlation between the two starts to decrease, and fairly drastically so. As we apply more frequency shift to the match uh, to the, the pulse, it no longer matches its match filter uh, nearly as well as it did before. And, and the result is it tapers off fairly quickly when we have a, a change in do um, Doppler shift. And this is one of the reasons when you're building a radar receiver, you're actually going to uh, have, like in most cases, uh, a series of match filters applied to maximize your, uh, your, your signal processing gain as we look at various different targets in their Doppler shift. Um, because you're going to get cases where we want to filter at the clutter, where we're looking at, for example, if it's a ground surveillance radar, people move at a particular speed, vehicles move at another particular speed, missiles move at another speed, air, uh, helicopters, aircraft, uh, and this is one of the ways we're able to distinguish uh, different platforms. So uh, we're going to change it now, go back into our simulation, and I have uh, a few pulses configured here based on some code I've written. And the second pulse is a linear frequency modulated pulse. And we some, see some key changes right away. And we'll start at the beginning again. And if you look down uh, well, in the upper le left, for example, we see a similar eight set of pulses. Um, there is, again, some noise applied and some random fluctuations in, in target radar cross section. Well, 
we can also see the modulation applied in the, in the lower portion of this plot. So um, we see the phase, it's linear frequency modulated. Uh, again, the, the I and Q components look like they're linear frequency modulated. Uh, and in this case, it's a, a four megahertz sweep we're looking at, and we can tell that from the delay, it's slept, swept over a total of uh, four megahertz over the length of the pulse. And similarly in the spectrum, again, it, it's got that flat spectra that's characteristic of a linear frequency modulated pulse. And we see similar stuff in the, in the spectrogram. So that's all fine. The more interesting perspective is actually going to be uh, when we start looking now at the response of the matched filter. And we'll start again in the, in the lower left, um, and this four megahertz signal, uh, before we were getting very much a broad, broad response from the match filter, because there really wasn't any bandwidth to get that signal processing gain, here we get an extraordinarily narrow pulse um, once the match filter is applied. So if we go back for a second to the previous set of plots, you can see in the upper left we have, you know, uh, we're looking at the same time scale as we are in the, in the next set. Uh, at 10 microsecond width of pulse, well, when we go to this, um, you know, the, the width of the pulse in, in microsection has been drastically reduced almost to a pinpoint on the graph, which is exactly what we want. In the lower right, we can see the, the radar cuboid again, um, and the response to the match filter as it changes with pulse repetition interval. And again, we're getting that, that really tight response, which when we integrate the pulses, we end up with uh, this response in the upper left. And here we're really starting to see the effects of the match filter. It's got an arrow response. It's really bringing the signal to the noise. And I'm going to demonstrate that further by making one change. We actually had a fairly high signal to noise ratio so far. Um, in this case, I've been applying a signal to noise ratio of 16 decibels. We're going to go down to a signal to noise ratio of zero decibels. Um, and we're going to look at the, the various signals. Okay. So we're getting some random fluctuations in the target, but you can see that we're starting to get, uh, especially in the virus spectrum, the, uh, the signal is not peaking much out, much out of the noise floor at this point. However, when we apply the matched filter, we can see that really demonstrating its value of the signal processing gain. Um, where before we had virtually no, go back to the first plot again, uh, the response of the target is generally down around the noise floor except for a few fluctuations which go up relatively high. Um, here, once the match filter is applied, we can easily distinguish them even though we've got an SNR effectively of zero. Um, and then with coherent integration, um, we see effectively a, the, the much improved response um, that we get in the range bin contents. And we can actually look at this a little further um, if we go to like a uh, let's say a, a minus eight decibel signal to noise ratio. We look at our radar return. We see one spike, but generally we can't really see anything with the radar return. It's almost random noise fluctuations, which is what we would expect. In the power spectrum, it's basically indistinguishable. And then when we go and apply our matched filter, well, there we go. It, uh, it digs the signal right out of the noise, and it does so for every pulse that we've received so far. Uh, and with coherent integration, we again uh, pick it right out of the noise floor. There is something we need, do need to go back and look at, and, and we'll improve the signal-to-noise ratio back up to 13 decibels to see it. Um, and that's one of the functions that really starts peaking out in the, uh, the matched filter. And that's these time domain side lobes. And that's the one downside of the linear frequency modulation. When we apply um, the linear frequency modulation, we don't get a central peak. Uh, we, we get effectively more of a sync waveform. Um, and we end up with these side lobes, which can appear as targets themselves. And if, for example, we have an air surveillance radar, a number of targets in close formation, often in clutter, it may be difficult to distinguish what is a target from a side lobe. Um, and the result is, we see these little peaks kind of trailing off. And you can see it again, really down here in the, in the lower left. Um, we have a peak and then we have these little side lobes uh, um, tapering off in there. Um, we look, can look at the ambiguity function though, and, and we'll see some interesting effects. So again, we look at the, the response to the Doppler, sh uh, to the, uh, the target shift, and we're getting something more we want. Uh, we're getting a little more taper off. 
the Doppler shift, we, when we look at it from that axis, uh, we're seeing something similar, but we're still getting some matching. What's really interesting in, with that the linear frequency modulation is when we look at it from above, you can see what we call range Doppler coupling. And I'm not going to get into that too much here, but what you're seeing is um, when we apply both some, sh we get a peak at the center, but when we apply some target shift in time, but no Doppler, we, it tapers off quickly, moving to the left or right. When we apply some just Doppler shift, it again tapers off quickly, uh, but we effectively get a local maximum at a specific um, area where the Doppler shift and the time shift um, intersect. Um, and the result is you can see um, the uh, ambiguity function has effectively been rotated uh, on an angle. So we're going to do one last waveform here. And uh, I'll just go down a little. And this is a PSK. That is a pulse a phase shift keyed 13-bit uh, Barker code. And this Barker code is actually fairly broad um, because it is only 13 bits. We haven't uh, really stacked the Barker codes onto each other, but we are getting a, an improved response. Um, and more importantly, we're seeing really one of the distinguishing um, criteria of the, uh, the Barker code in a few seconds, and that's the elimination of time domain side lobes. So we uh, start again in the, in the time domain looking at our, our pulses. They get sent out, they get returned from the target. Um, we see the power spectrum of the Barker code. It is fairly narrow, which is again characteristic of these things. Uh, the phase in the lower left, you can see it's hopping around a little. Um, it's bouncing back and forth between its uh, 180 and minus 180 configurations, which imply phase shift keying. Uh, and then we can see uh, similar stuff going on over in the, uh, the uh, delay in the uh, I and Q. It's not what we're interested in. We want to see its match filter response. And that's showing up right here. So we have a, a few things we're seeing. Um, first of all, we will start in the lower left. We get the match filter response. It is for each individual pulse. Um, it is not terribly improved over the uh, continuous wave pulse, but we are get, or the unmodulated pulse, I should more appropriately say, but we're still getting um, some improvement in range resolution due to the fact that we have modulated the pulse. We're also not getting those time domain side lobes. What we saw before with the the, the um, uh, linear frequency waveform was that taper off and those little side lobes to the side. These have been eliminated with the Barker code at a cost of range resolution. Now, we can see that in the same effects in the radar cuboid. Uh, we again, in the upper left, we can integrate these, coherently integrate these pulses, and we can detect the target. Um, and then lastly, if we wanted to go over and look at it in the ambiguity function, um, we are seeing shape. It actually looks fairly similar to the, uh, the, um, the unmodulated pulse, uh, where we're seeing some tapering off uh, in a similar fashion on the Dopp from the Doppler perspective, that is, it starts to become uh, decorrelated fairly quickly. And then uh, some improvement in the range resolution compared to the unmodulated pulse um, we get from the, the shift in, in, uh, in the, uh, the target delay. So that is a quick overview of some of the responses of match filters and how we can examine them uh, compared to, to uh, various different types of radar waveform modulations. I hope you found this helpful, and if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments.